Maybe you just read an article or you, you came across an interesting company or you know, what's top of mind and then maybe what's, what's keeping you up at night? Right. There's maybe two different things. Yeah. Okay. Um, actually, you touched upon it, your, your slides touched upon it pretty, pretty well. First is, um, what's top of mind is this display really get its act together online. I mean, we, you know, we've seen a search dominated world, and, and by the way, I 100% agree with you about video and rich media being part of display. I think it's ridiculous that, it's, that, that those are different designations. But I think the big question is where they're displayed in the, in the online world. It, you know, another way to look at it is about 3% of online ad spending is display, 3% share is a, a, a display advertising has moved online, which seems incredibly low. It's incredibly low when you look at the consumption. Another slide you, you went through relatively quickly, but about 30% of media time is spent online. So for only 3% of display, it seems, it seems ridiculous. So, that really has to get sorted out. I think that's kind of number one for all of us, no matter which chair we're in. Um, and, and even if you're Google, because A, they're moving into that with their exchange, yeah. right? And B, it also obviously affects the search, search share. So I think that's kind of number one for, for, for the advertising uh, business. The second thing, and, and again, you touched on it, is the whole mobile thing. And, and we're very, everything you said, I think is exactly right in the slides and what they imply, but two, two further codas. One is, is the mobile web, so to speak, is it a derivative of the web, or is it a new beast? And I don't think we know that one yet. On one hand, you put up that slide that said, you know, the behaviors kind of look the same. Right. I'm not sure, I'm not sure. Uh, because if you think, you know, apps aren't the thing in, in, the, in the browser, right? right? Apps are a mobile right. thing. So that's, a, and, and you know, ringtones was a whole new behavior <laughs> that, that, that was created in the mobile environment, didn't have an analog in, in what's called PC web. So I'm, I'm in the camp that says, let's be cautious in the sense of not just thinking this is an extension, but this may be a new medium. And so what does that mean? And, and what do people do? That's one. Two, um, I think the, the, the other thing is we were very US-centric in, in how we think about it here for, for probably, because that's what is our collective brand. Right. <laughs> but I just returned from a, a trip to Asia. I was there for two weeks. And you know, here we're talking about the mobile web as, a, as um, you know, as the growth thing. There, there is the thing. You know, if you're in East Asia, in China, uh, Japan, Korea, where I was, the mobile web is the web, right? That is the way people are accessing the internet by, net, by maybe it's two years. At the latest, it's two years. There'll be more people on, on broadband through, through a mobile device in China than there are people in the United States. And the question then becomes, is that an advertising medium? It should be, but, but it may be a transactional medium first before it's an advertising medium. What, what keeps it up at uh, are those some other things that is there something else? You know, the thing that kind of keeps me up at night, you know, it, it sort of uh, different parts of my, my, my job and my life. One, one is this whole free versus paid uh, discussion that's going on um, in, in the media content industries, and how does that shake out? Um, I think that, you know, if you're a content produ producer uh, company, you obviously feel there's, you've got to have a way to really get value for your content, and that leads you into a paid discussion. Um, and, I, and then there's you know, a lot of the, the history of the internet so far has been that's, that's not an easy thing, right? It's, it's sort of, you know, content is very promiscuous and it's pirated and all this kind of stuff. So, you know, the, I think that is a really big, if you're talking about media companies, that is a really big issue, right? And how that gets sorted through everything from the newspaper world to, to you know, highly produced film and television, big deal, big deal. And trying to, you know, really understand that in the context of the real world of, you know, if you're following the stuff, retransmission and right. authentication and all that stuff, big, big, you know, that, that swirls around my head. How do, you, uh, how do you decide, I know there's a lot of media people, we've been talking a lot about media here in New York, and the, the free versus pay has come up constantly, and it's going to yeah. come up constantly for two and a half days. How do you decide, you know, how do you go through business cases and decide whether I should charge for content or whether it should be free? If we start with the basic sort of premise, oh, content wants to be free, but if you look at, you know, the journal was blessed with making a decision very early on and then sticking with it, of course, and having that luxury that they stuck with it. But now it's a little bit, it's a little bit more difficult. Whether you're an established player with established content, even if you've tried to charge, maybe as we know some companies have and they pulled away, but how do you, how do you make that decision? How do you, you know, what's the decision making process? I think at this point you have to have a really crystal clear value proposition. I don't think you can say, I don't think you can just do what I call the good news conversation. Good news, you used to, you used to get this for free, now I'm going to charge you. I don't think you can deliver that kind of good news. I don't think that works so well. I think you have to have a real strong value proposition and know what it is. And the journal, it does have that. I mean, the journal clearly, it clearly has it. I think it, it raises the bar um, for other, other folks to have you know, that strongly. And I think a little bit of context, not just for the journal, but in general. If you look back a few years on the net, 
there wasn't that much differentiation between experiences. You could substitute one from the other pretty quickly. Now I think we're seeing the rise of premium experiences. That's not a surprise. You have better bandwidth to, to transmit better experiences. You have more sophistication in creating it. You have things like Hulu, which, you know, which have a great web tech presentation, so to speak. Consumer experience with great, highly produced content. And you have that stuff coming together. And by the way, you can charge a high CPM for that. And it's a really good experience. It's a premium experience. So unless you have premium experiences with real value proposition, you don't have a place to start. Right? So I think that you've got to start from that. Like, what's the value proposition? That's one. Two, the interesting thing, again, about the whole mobile thing, is people seem willing to pay about that environment. People are paying for Kindles. People are paying for a subscription to things in Kindles, for example. I, I myself pay personally for the journal and for the New York Times and for a series of blogs that I read and some other publications on my Kindle. And people seem ready to do that. So one is you've got to take advantage, I think, of this behavior as well. Um, is, where people will pay. Is there a difference in regards to the, the same decision, whether we should charge or whether it should be for free, uh, in regards to sort of my online property or my mobile property? This is, does the consumer see the mobile platform as just inherently more premium? It's, it's wow, it's on my mobile device, that's pretty cool, I can get it anywhere, and therefore I'm more likely or more able to charge for something because it's a mobile app as opposed to you know, some sort of premium content on the PC, uh, on a PC-based internet? Yeah, I, I do think there is some of that. I, I think there, there is some where it is considered, the portability, the convenience is considered worth paying for. So I think part of what you have to do, again, as part of, as part of the value proposition, is you've got to go bundle all that together. And you've got to have you know, bundled things that are both uh, premium content, premium experiences, the convenience, all that stuff in one, I think, is what could work. Is there anything that you think consumers just simply won't pay for yeah. over time? And just, yeah. I mean, there's a bunch of stuff. I mean, there's what you would call commodity news, you know, sports scores. Um, I don't think people are going to pay to know the Yankees won last night. I think, you know, people kind of got that. Right. Um, but I think, you know, there, there are, you, so you have to have, again, a real clear um, value proposition. I, you know, personally, I can envision a day when most of the news consumption is, is not only online, it's mobile, right? It's through a mobile device, it's electronic readers. I can, I can imagine the same for television and movies. You know, uh, nothing against the DVD industry, but, you know, when you have nice screens traveling around with you in secu hopefully secure environments, things can happen. Um, we we kind of went into the weeds a little bit. I want to come back a little bit to the, to the macro level and just you know your view of the state of the you know state of the media economy, but also for our crowd, the state of the digital media economy. Are uh, my sense is we finally are seeing a little bit of life and activity. I, I call it sort of reverse inertia. I think people are just tired of sitting around and they want to get out. They want to get out to shows and they want to start making things happen. Are, are you seeing any life in your conversations with advertisers and, and the buyers on the agency side? And, we start to see some movement and some life. Yeah, so I think the, the good news is yes. And I think part of it is, um, you know, this last budget cycle, if you think about just the, the real world reality, budgets for this year, this calendar year, were done in October of last year, right? That's when you're doing your budget process in October and November. And guess what? You, you pulled everything in that you could, right? There was nobody, there was nobody submitting a corporate budget in any company anywhere saying, hey, you know, it's probably going to be a really bad year, but let's up our marketing uh, spend next yeah, year. Right. Let's really go for it. Um, and nobody did that. So I think budgets were really held in and very cautiously now are starting to be released. And as we start to go into the next budgeting cycle, which is really, we're in, you know, we're in now, I think we'll, 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 there'll be budgeted increases. So I think in general, we'll see marketing services spend, you know, increase year over year. No big prediction in a sense, but I think that there's a mechanic that allows that to happen. Right. The second is the consumption of the consumer has just continued straight. I mean, even though we've had this economic downturn, the consumption pattern, you had it up there quickly, has been just this straight, you know, up line in terms of more online consumption. So the dollars have to chase that. They have to. And that goes back to what we were saying earlier about display advertising. That's where the big lag has been. So I think there's, there's increasing pressure to get that figured out. And I think that's the big thing. I would hope that, you know, the calendar, you know, 2010 and 2011 are really breakthrough years in that regard. In that battle, and, and I've fought for the digital dollar for 15 years and had those conversations, and a lot of people out here are trying to get the dollars as well. As we, it seems to me like through the recession, and because digital is measurable and online is measurable and all these types of things, it's been a slightly easier argument for us, right? Oh, well, put your money here because ROI is important, and measurability is important, you know, efficiency is important. 
but if we're now come out of this, then it's sort of back to the battle against the traditional media dollars, which may start to grow again. So if anything, it seems like the battle might become a little more difficult again. So what's going to be the message moving forward? Is a sort of combination of efficiency, but video is going to give you the branding type of, of benefit and those things? What's the message moving so, forward? So, yeah, so let's get into it. It's, it's sort of two, two levels. One is that you, you have um, both an increased market service to spend overall, and you have share shift. So you should have two good drivers. You can take a little bit of share and you can get over, there's an overall increase. So it should be a good year going into 2010 overall for advertising, online advertising. Doesn't mean it's, it's like some years past. I think good year means double digits right, right. right now. It get, breaks into double digit growth. So I think that's one. Then the second is, uh, um, uh, on, particularly on display advertising, so we're talking about how does that market shape up. And I think it, should, it bifurcates into a, a premium market and then what I call a targeted market. And then there's a third, which is long tail. As you showed, that's still long tail. So let's, let's leave that for the moment, because I think the, the money is in the premium and in what I call targeted inventory. So the premium market that's really about mar integrated marketing programs is more like a brand spend, is more sales force driven, and that has to just get more sophisticated. I think one of the things that's happened in the last few years is people have pulled back from that. I think if you just look at the big players, on, on, the, on the big sellers in particular on the net have pulled back from that and got to re-engage. Right. And hopefully we'll be one of them. But I mean, I think as an industry, the industry has to re-engage and go after those premium um, dollars. Hulu's done that, by the way, as an example, that it does happen. Um, then you have the targeted, which is you know, data-driven. And can, can you basically apply a lot of the learning and understandings that came from search, which is how you can run data-driven environments um, for advertisers? And can you take a, a huge amount of, of inventory that is targetable and make it more valuable? And I think that actually is going to be the next big dollar shift. And that's where it's going to go, into that. And we talk, we talk a lot about audiences and, and, and targeting by audience and audience networks that are out there. And I have several questions that are related to sort of these audience networks uh, that are being built both by the buy side and the sell side, right? Yeah. So, you know, talk to me a little bit in, in the audience about, you know, what's happening in the Fox audience network and, and what is a Fox audience network? And these, these media companies that are building sort of these vertical networks and these audience networks, what is it and, 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 and why is that going to be, you know, a, a valuable piece for you moving forward? What, what are buyers going to find intriguing about that, um, say, versus other online inventory? Sure. So um, I, I, I love that. And that. You did say that we had an announcement to make, which we just told you earlier today. We were going to, so when I walk up the stage, I'll have a formal announcement. I'll, I'll work it in here. So okay, you know, sure. Use your conference to the best effect. <laughs> um, but Fox Audience Network, in case you don't know, um, fan. Uh, it, it is, is, I think, really poised to, to be um, right in the center of this, this, this uh, what I call targeted display um, advertising uh, growth. And if, if we ask the audience, you know, name the top five um, ad networks in the United States, I'll bet you people would get four of the five, pretty likely Yahoo, Google, Lego, and Microsoft, and wouldn't get five necessarily, which is FAN, the Fox Audience Network. So we've quietly um, really built that up over the last year, and, and it leveraged off MySpace. And, and MySpace, as you, as you may know, has about 60 ish million users. Fox Audience Network has about 158. So not even half the people come from inside the house anymore. It started there, but now it's, it's gone out. And it's really at the height, uh, I mean, the heart of what you're talking about, which is we believe that by adding audience insights to, to um, what would otherwise be not differentiated inventory, you make it more valuable. And so starting from the social networking environment, where people tell you a lot about themselves. In, in what they call, for getting into the terms, unstructured data, right? Things you got to look at and say, what does this really mean about that person or that audience? And structure it. Once you structure it and get, make it useful, not only as a seller, you make it useful to a buyer. And what's, been, what's, what's great, and this is kind of the announcement uh, today, is we have a partnership we're announcing with WPP, Sir Martin, who was here yesterday, who I understand talked a lot about audience insights. Yes, did. This is around that. We're going to be providing insight to, to, their, to, 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 to WPP. They're going to be using our tools, which include real-time bidding. We have a great real-time bidding engine. And they're going to be providing further information and insight to us, which we're all going to put together. So we're trying to build, you know, hopefully one of the great, robust um, not, um, insight tools for the buy side, as well as the sell side that we represent. Will this include um, third-party content that maybe not your Absolutely. Right. That's absolutely, absolutely. Absolutely. Most of it, at this point, comes from third parties. Most of the inventory. And then, if, you know, there are a lot of companies here probably who are building their own networks, whether large or small or even medium-sized. Is there any advice that you have to them in terms of as you're building that back end, 
these targeting capabilities, the data capabilities, you know, are you, is it most of it, you know, you're, you're building yourself as a proprietary technology and, and, and programming engineering, or are you, are you partnering with companies to yeah, make this go? Yeah, you know, and it, it, the answer to, is, is yes to both. I mean, yes, there's a bunch of stuff that's proprietary, the real-time bidding system is, some of the audiences are very, uh, the audience information inside is very proprietary. However, if you sort of do your whiteboard and, and like put all the boxes that it, that, it, that it takes to make an ecosystem, nobody checks all the boxes except the um, closest is Google, <laughs> but nobody else checks all those boxes. And in fact, you've got to really partner. I think if you're any other company other than that, you've got to partner uh, to, to, to fill it all in. Going back to... Uh, and, and, and yeah, well, I think what's important is, is both on the, buy, on the sell side to make your inventory and your audiences perceivable and valuable, and then on the buy side, which is we're doing like with this announcement with WPP, to make them enabled so they can go, oh look, I see it. I see what's valuable here and how it matches up to my needs, and now you, now you can transact. And that I think has been lacking. I, I love your thoughts on there's this, uh, been following this very closely for three years, and, and uh, we've had so many panels on it, so many people talking about it. This whole thing, inventory is in play, right? right. So whether, you know, the ad networks want more premium inventory, you want to sell more directly, you know, the buy side and, and say Cadrian of, of media brands is building their own, all these buy side networks that are being built, WPP has their own, and Vidikey has their own, everybody has their own. You know, are, are ad networks going to be disintermediated? Is there a risk that ad networks may be disintermediated? Not all of them, but perhaps some of them, as you want to hold on to more inventory. You can't sell direct, I imagine you want to sell in your own third party, in your own, you know, in fan, if you're not selling it directly premium. So that may take some inventory away from some of the ad networks who want it. But then could the buy side networks also take inventory away if they have a direct link into your best inventory? Does that take away some inventory also? Well, you, you asked a very interesting question whether you meant to or not. <laughs> I hope that. <laughs> <laughs> I hope that so I'm going to answer the basic question. I'm going to answer it right I, I don't know if you meant it or not, with, but what you did ask. Um, the basic question is on um, uh, disintermediation. Yeah. Uh, I think it's a scale game. And that scale is not just that you have more inventory than the other guy or more techniques, but more insights on all of the above. And there's only going to, and, and scale matters because you, 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 you do get the insights, you just can see the matches better, you have uh, fill rates, all these other things. You know? So it is a scale game, there'll be a few players. I, I think that's just the way it works. Some of the big guys will always hope, want to get more and more of their inventory, but they'll never ever be able to use it all. So there's definitely a role for exchanges and networks in that regard. I think we're moving more to an exchange model as the insights get better and the tools like real-time bidding get better. So I, I'm, I'm of the belief that kind of the first wave was networks and now it's moving to exchanges. And, can I ask and so do you think the exchanges in, in regards, do you think the cadreons of the world and the buy side um, networks that they're building will be more exchange oriented yes. as opposed to sort of network oriented? Yes, I think going forward, yes. yes. Purely real time, it's a real time bidding I, situation. I think that's where this goes. Sorry. But then, yeah. what you also asked, if you're on the buy side and you do all of this, you, what, you, what you could do is you could be in the arbitrage business. You could, you could buy a bunch of inventory and then arbitrage that yourself. I would assume that's partly what they're going to do. Well, but it puts you potentially in, 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 potentially in a conflict of interest with your clients. Right? Because then you're trying to make margin on, on what you bought as opposed to what, you, what you're buying for them. So it, it, it's a line that you have to be very careful about. And heretofore in the United States, that has not been an acceptable model. In Japan, for example, there's a, 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 a you know there's Dentsu, which has really been a, a phenomenal uh, agency in business that has, for the longest amount of time, been on the buy and sell side of the television business, where it buys directly the inventory from the television networks in Japan and resells it to its client base. Right. And they've managed to figure out how to do that and, and you know, for its clients to, to remain happy. So it's not impossible. But it, it, there is an inherent issue in there that you have to figure out. And maybe they can do it because they have monopoly. Almost. I, I don't want to 60% share. Um, so it's a good business. Yeah. Obviously, we, we want to talk a little about MySpace. And you know, you made some great hires you know, from, from Owen yeah. and Nod and Jason Hershorn and, and Nod Estrada. a great team. Where does MySpace go from here? I think that you know, one of the great trends is it's the, what's extracted from any specific companies, but one of the great trends for a moment, one of the great trends is the socialization of the internet. We have a couple of things going on at the same time. We have real time, this is the big trends in the net in my opinion. You have real time in a variety of ways. We just talked about it in advertising, but it's in news and information as well. And data streams and Twitter is an example of that. So you have real time, you have mobile, and you have socialization. All happening at the same time. And so I think that you know, we have one of the great socialization assets. And what we have to do is focus on, on where, where can you win. And that win is around, as we like to say um, it, um, internally, 
interest-based, what, what people are into. So we think that Facebook, in some ways, is about what people are up to, right. and MySpace is about what people are into, and how do you follow your interests and go deep, and things like music, where we're clearly right. making an initial you know, revitalization around that and, and, and going well. So it's really going to be interest-based, and, and that leads to premium, more premium environments that you can sell, for example, because you'll have real content, and you'll have content, um, and you'll have a really interesting content distribution system. Um, that can move content around based on peer, peer uh, interest rather than you know kind of broadcast interest. So it's, I think it's really really going in, in, in not only the right direction, direction but in an interesting direction uh, for me, for media companies. And just more broadly about social media, uh, going back to the late '90s, we had GeoCities and the Globe and Tripod and Friendster, MySpace, Facebook, and now Twitter is the shiny new object. Is, it, is there always going to be a what's next in social media? And is, is, do you have any, whether it's a particular site or whether it's tools and technologies that allow people to sort of build their own social networks, do you have a sense in, in sort of what's next in the, the social media you know, space? Well, so first of all, will there always be a next new thing? Absolutely. I mean, that's, we're, we're in a developing medium that's part of what makes it fun. There's always a next new thing. On Twitter, there's an interesting note, and if you're following it really closely in the last month, if you follow the numbers, they, they've started to flatten. Yeah. And they've not just flattened to Twitter directly, but to all the way doors into Twitter. And it could be, you know, it could be a hiccup, it could be nothing, you know, just it keeps and then it just keeps going. It could be one possibility is that, that Twitter is not really a youth phenomenon, it's more adult. And it'd be interesting, maybe it has to capture the youth to keep going. Um, or three, and this is the one that would be most concerning if, if you're them. Uh, it, is, it may be that the, that the changes that Facebook has made have, have affected the, the usage of Twitter. And, and you know, that would be another credit to Facebook because they've shown uh, truly an ability to expand their, their borders and to adapt to a lot of things. If, if that's the case, it's a big deal both for Facebook and for Twitter in that regard. We're, uh, we're going to get we're a little tight on time, so I'm asking them to get the mics ready as we go to the audience, and I'll just have a, a couple uh, a time for a couple questions to, to sort of close. And I, I wish we had more time because I'm enjoying this. Uh, you know, as you started your job at, at News Corp, and, and you know, you've seen a lot in the U.S., and you've obviously had tremendous experience in the United States. But I'm curious, as you've sort of gone around the world and looked at all these digital properties within the News Corp family, what's what have you found fascinating or interesting, or whether you think it's something that a trend will follow here, or maybe not? Yeah. It could be something unique to a country or a country. Well, it is one of the things I like about News Corp. It is unquestionably the most global of the American-based um, media companies. I mean, there's no question about that. And, and, and it's fun, though, with Rex Havoc on your personal schedule. Um, uh, the thing that you know, most, most of me is, is this trip to Asia I was saying about the mobile internet, that, that it's just, again, it's, we're thinking about how it's happening here. It has happened there, and it will happen here. And that becomes the central point of control. You're looking at smartphones in Japan, that, that not only can you watch digital television on your smartphone live, but, but they, have, um, they have a phone there, Sharp makes it, um, with two digital tutors in it. So that means you can watch a channel of live television while you're recording like a DVR on another channel on your smartphone, flip over the screen, have a touch screen phone, and you know, it's, it's a typical smartphone size. And when you start having things like that, you realize this is going to be your, your, your access point. This is going to be your access and control point for your media slash internet slash communications experience for sure. I mean, I just think for sure. So we're still, in many ways, I think we're still here just getting to grips with, oh, this is a real thing, and it's kind of, it's kind of thought of as the iPhone, which right. for obvious reasons when you put up those stats here. But it's, it's an overall trend, and it's an overall movement that is, I think, a fundamental one. Right. We went the house slides, we're going to go to the audience. Before we go to the audience, real quick, do you have a thought about agencies in regards to you know, creative and media? You know? I actually thought you were exactly right, and you're one of the few people I've heard say it loudly and publicly, which is that you know, the traditional agency structure has been creatives dominate, they get highly paid, they're, they're the names you know, they're the ones you see in the meetings, and then you go down and ten, you know, ten meetings later you meet the actual gremlin who's supposed to buy the media. You know, and that's that's been the historical, you know, they, they bring them out of the closet and you know and piece up some stats and you go, you know, you know, get away from the stats. I want to see the nice pictures. Yeah. Um, you know, and BBDO, which I, an agency I've worked with, has done great creative work. You know, you go to them because of they're great creative, and they're, they're particularly on television, right? And again, you know, media gremlin comes out later, media buying gremlin, maybe that's all. By the way, we can talk about the interactive part of that too. Um, right. And I think that I think the paradigm has fundamentally flipped going forward. That the media buying slash media insights slash planning 
That becomes the center thing. And that's when you're going to make your buying decision if you're a client, meaning what agencies do I work with? And it's going to flow from that to the creative and other stuff because you're addressing audiences. And you have to have the audience insight to know what creative you should do. The gremlins will rule the day. The gremlins, you know, it's like the, the gremlins, gremlins still, are still huge. I'm not down on creative. Because yeah, you've got to have the right creative at the end of the day, too. You know, because otherwise people won't respond. But, but the process in the pyramid is, going to, it is and it will inevitably flip now. I agree. Um, so we actually have some text questions coming in too, and I'll try to do one in the audience with the mic. Um, can you speak to what third parties are in fan? So what types of what types of sites do you look to partner with? You know, what's your criteria for getting a third party? Yeah, it's a lot of the big branded um, so-called portals that you that you would hope to see, as well as a variety of of, uh, of smaller sites that have real brands. Because I, mean, I think that the, the distinction is right now it is hard to do true long tail, right. and to bring the true long tail all the way up in, in, into the four. But so it needs to be a, a safe branded environment. Um, and brand in this case means sites that you know you recognize and, and, and you know. So it's a combination of, of us, other other big players, and a series of brands. Do you look at a demographic and like, oh, let's we want to partner with more sites that are in the male 18 to 30. No, no, we're right. kind of going for it. I mean, 158 million users and climbing. Right. Uh, we're going for it. Right. We want to go across the board. Right, let me go to a question in the audience. There we go, right here. If you can stand and say your name and where you're from. Hello. Jonathan Taku from Intent Media. Curious what your response is in a real-time bidding understanding that's going around, which is basically it's a winner-take-all market. Price transparency, everything being decided, Google's pixels being effectively everywhere. Now that they're really moving forward, Fox is pushing its real-time bidding, and Fox has some great properties. But do you see this winner-take-all market where all you have to do is be one cent better, all of a sudden this price transparency brings this liquidity to an auction. Where does Fox stand in terms of its viability in that real-time bidding of its own? Sure. I think that goes to, to a question I was asked a few moments ago. I think that there will only be a couple of real big plays, and I think anybody but Google, as, as I said before, has to really partner um, to get there. Um, I don't think there's anybody but Google that can do it on their own. And so I think you'll, you'll see, a, a, I believe you'll see, a variety of folks agree to work together in one shape or form to create scale, liquidity, and all the things that, that, that are needed um, to have at least a two-horse town. I can see a two-horse town, so to speak. I'm not sure, maybe, maybe there's even a way to do a third. I'm not sure if there's four, five, and six. So I don't, I don't think it's quite a winner-take-all, but unless what I just said happens, it will end up that way. I don't think it has to be that way, but it will end up that way unless what I just said happens. The, that makes a good point, but and I, I do have to close this out. The, the pixels, and particularly the buy side networks that are putting, you know, they put a pixel in it yeah. and they follow the inventory. Who owns the data? Yeah, that's great. Um, look, that is a fun, that is a big question because if you ask uh, consumers, well, first of all, consumers have fundamental rights, so you don't even have to ask them. They have those you have respect. If you ask them, hey, Mr. and Ms. Consumer, how do you feel about your privacy? And the answer is, I feel strongly um, about my privacy. If on the other hand you say, do you, do you know there's a pixel there on, your, on what you're doing, and, and you know, as a result, uh, you know, there's some nice ads that are being served to you, and they're better than it would happen otherwise. And then and the general response that is, okay. Right. So you know, all that has to get worked out, and one of the things I think is we've got to be non-hyped um, about this. It, it has to be serious, it's got to work for an industry, it's got to work for consumers, and, and respect the fundamental rights. And we've got to have those guidelines, and I think we, they're, they're going to go another turn because of these exchanges, these yep. pixels. There's another turn of this wheel coming. And, and what we have to do is just be sober about it and get through it because all of the above is solvable, and, it's, and, and all of the above needs to be taken into account. You can't leave any piece of it off. As we sort of exit out of this recession, hopefully maybe a slow trog out, but as we move forward into hopefully you know, greener pastures, any advice for, for the audience, whether it's starting new companies or selling digital media or, you know, what, what, what advice do you give them as we move forward in the future today? So, so starting new companies, 2010, so starting new companies you know, I was in the investment world for a yeah. you know, um, number of years before this. Um, do what you love, because you know, I don't think you should be thinking about it as the quick flip uh, kind of situation. You've got, you got to be doing something you want to be in. You've got to, you got to be doing it because you intend to build a real business that, that if you do have an accident, it's going to be because it's a real business. There's going to be very few just you know uh, things we like we've seen in the past where people pay tons of money for things that may be a business. So you got to do it because you really want to do it. And, and that said, there's a lot to do. All of these things that we're talking about, video is still young and not underdeveloped. The, these, the, all the stuff around these exchange models and how it operates is still young and underdeveloped. I think there'll be many models of content that are underdeveloped. 
So I think it's a great time, but you shouldn't jump in with both feet unless you intend to, to swim for a while. Right. That's, <laughs> that's good. I like that. Um, I wish we had another hour, but uh, a big round of applause for Jonathan Moore. Thank you.